Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Tensions between Beirut and Jerusalem surrounding efforts by the Islamic Republic of Iran to bolster its Lebanese proxy Hezbollah, a dispute over Lebanese offshore energy explorations, as well as a defensive border wall under construction by Israel along the frontier demarcation line, have raised yet again the prospects of an armed confrontation between the two enemy states. To further discuss the situation on the Israeli-Lebanese frontier, I'm joined here in the studio by Brigadier General in Reserve Yossi Kupelwasser, who is the Project Director on Middle East Developments at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Professor Zev Khanin, who is an expert on Russian and Middle Eastern studies at Barilan and Ariel Universities. Welcome. My pleasure. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of the latest developments on this issue. The term you used, enemy states, is actually used mostly by the Lebanese, especially President Michel Aoun, when uh, he refers to Israel. Israel uh, doesn't have um, any claim on Lebanon. Of course, uh, it uh, doesn't like the fact that Hezbollah is there. It is hostile towards it, and it gets more and more powerful. But Israel has no hostile intentions vis-à-vis uh, -vis Lebanon. Lebanon, on the other hand, uh, disputes two of Israel's actions. One is the construction of a wall along the uh, southern border between uh, Lebanon and Israel, um, which Lebanon claims in 13 particular points uh, enters, penetrates uh, uh, Lebanese territory, if only uh, by a few uh, yards. The other one has to do with the uh, gas reserves in the Mediterranean, where there are two conflicting claims for a very certain, very small part of the uh, Mediterranean, some uh, 330 square miles um, of uh, the territory, where Lebanon wants to give concessions to foreign companies. Uh, General Kopperwasser, uh could you give us a more specific indication? Is it truly so that uh, uh, the the midpoint, uh, if we talk about the maritime dispute, uh, in which two countries who do not have a peace agreement with each other need to identify a midpoint in order to uh, assert where the explorations may take place with regarding to gas drillings and exploration. Uh, we're talking, as uh, Mr. Oren said, about Block 9, which is uh, a three-part uh, block of uh, what various countries indicate might uh, contain significant uh, amounts of gas in those territories. Uh, to what degree is either country willing to go to war over such a thing, uh, especially following the rhetoric of both uh, countries uh, with regard to their willingness to do so? Well, first of all, it's very difficult to speak about Lebanon as a country that wants to go to war, doesn't want to go to war, because in a way uh, the Lebanese uh, government has uh, endorsed the responsibility for going to war to the hands of Hezbollah. So the question is whether Hezbollah wants to go to war and not whether Lebanon go, wants to go to war. And the Hezbollah can force its will over the Lebanese uh, state, unfortunately. Now, from the point of view of Hezbollah, I think what they are more interested in right now is that this entire dispute about where exactly and how exactly to draw the line, because there are two ways of drawing it, and, but it's a, it's a technical matter that can be discussed on a legal uh, basis. But uh, what the Hezbollah uh, is driven by is they need an excuse, uh, justification for remaining a power in Lebanon, and they need uh, an ex uh, justification for their claim that they are a jihadistic organization that defends Lebanon and, and is determined to fight against the expansionist uh, aspirations of Israel. And uh, since on many other issues, this uh, has, uh, they don't find an excuse like that. Now, this is a new uh, tool that they, they can use in, in order to justify that, especially in, in a time where they are heavily criticized for the way they are operating in a way that serves Iranian interests and not Lebanese interests, or Assad interests and not Lebanese interests, or any other uh, foreign interest but the Lebanese interest. So it's for them, here is a golden opportunity to say, well, actually, we are here to defend in Lebanese interests. I'm not sure they want to go to war over that, but it's a very uh, useful uh, uh, pretext for uh, explaining why they are there. And just, you know, this is the big debate in Lebanon, is what is the justification for having uh, an organization like that 
after all the Lebanese territories are now under the, uh, the government of the Le- Lebanese government. Well, what do they need actually uh, the so-called resistance for? And uh, I think this is what the main, the main uh, drive behind uh, Hezbollah's uh, activities. They know that if they will turn that into a pretext for war, they're going to pay heavily. And, uh, and it, it, reflect, it is reflected also in the other issues that you mentioned in the beginning, which is the, the fact that uh, the Iranians are, in order to support Hezbollah, are now using Le- or attempting to use Lebanese territory in order to build military infrastructure in Lebanon that would serve uh, Hezbollah uh, military needs. This, Israel has already declared that this is going to be some sort of a red line from an Israeli point of view. And here again, what is proven is that Lebanon, that Hezbollah not only is not the protector of uh, Lebanon, it's not the shield of Lebanon, but actually it's an explosive shield. If they continue to move the way they want, they will make they may cause terrible damage to Lebanon. And we'll touch uh, base uh, on this uh, challenge as well in, uh, during this discussion. Professor Hanin on the maritime issue, to what extent uh, does Israel uh, perceive the situation as a concrete challenge that may result in uh, a more of an armed conflict, particularly even though, uh, as General Professor has stated, uh, this is a technical issue. We heard Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman, who was very vocal and very clear about this during a, a security conference earlier this year, where he uh, indicated that Israel perceives this territory as its uh, own and is willing to go to war if necessary. Absolutely. Uh, Taking explanation of Mr. Oren and the line of uh, uh, General Kuperwasser, I would say that between spring 2000 and uh, summer 2006, we hear, or at least somebody in our uh, military political leadership believed that Israel would do, would go upon any experiment, meaning to get out, uh, to unilaterally disengage from any territory, believing that in this territory, at the end of the day, it will be a regime that will be interested to preserve a so-called peaceful coexistence with Israel indefinitely long. At the moment, we understand that that's not the case. And uh, uh, even more, as uh, General Kuperwasser said, now we have a different story. Uh, Like uh, 10 years ago, many of us believed that, in fact, we have uh, Hezbollah, a terrorist movement. uh, And uh, there there was a discussion whether who is the enemy. Uh, the military wing of the terrorist movement or the whole movement. Uh, but uh, they were also patronized for, by the Lebanon government, which actually didn't have any specific force to control the issue. That is why the Lebanon government is not the case, is not the part of the deal, and we have to go upon anti-terrorist operation. At the moment, we understand that the situation is totally opposite, that our enemy is Lebanon, Lebanon, which is actually ruled by the terrorist movement, but in fact, that's the case of uh, conventional war. And in this war, uh, each side is responsible for their damages and gainings. Um, uh, and both Hezbollah and Lebanon, as n- nearby Syria, is patronized by, uh, by Iran. But they also have um, a friend, which is Russia. And that is a much more complicated situation. That is why probably we can, I might come back to what Mr. Oren said. Uh, and you said, you, you mentioned Defense Minister Viktor Lieberman, who said that actually that's a conventional war, which where Israel should win as soon as possible without taking into consideration any international public opinion and so on and so forth. Uh, from this point of view, we may say that uh, 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 if some would take it as a deterioration force, meaning that Israel is serious mm-hmm. and Americans standing behind Israel, Israel are serious. They might uh, consider their further future steps also seriously. Mr. Oren, on the maritime dispute of uh, gas explorations, why when there is such a significant dispute, which is still ongoing, and there are, of course, talks uh, mediated both by uh, Rex Tillerson, uh, U.S. Secretary of State, as well as uh, the United Nations, which are trying to alleviate uh, the tension surrounding this issue. Why do international corporations, including gas exploration companies from Russia, from Italy, from France, uh, take upon uh, the uh, tender that was published by Beirut earlier last month? Well, they really don't, or not yet. Uh, Of course, they consider the bid because it's attractive. But this is the very reason why they're also the target audience for threats such as Lieberman's, because if uh, foreign investors 
in whatever field um, are afraid that uh, this is not a stable environment and that there might be not only a war between Israel and Lebanon, but that their own assets uh, can be uh, hit uh, during the hostilities. Of course, they are not going uh, to come in, and this is a very, very early stage in exploration. Now, all of this uh, area, the, the gas and oil area uh, on the uh, shelf of the Mediterranean, is relatively new. It didn't exist in the year 2000 when Israel left South Lebanon. It didn't exist even six years later uh, during the fighting between Israel and Hezbollah. It only goes back some eight or nine years when the huge reserves uh, were found uh, in the Mediterranean and Israel has shifted from oil to gas uh, in its uh, energy consumption, but also energy dependence. So now we have a whole new front of offshore facilities, um, derricks and uh, other, other facilities, uh, which are threatened by shore-to-sea missiles, by uh, naval commandos, by submarines, and uh, therefore uh, this whole area must be pacified. And, and you mentioned uh, the mediation. Now, a week ago, Secretary Tillerson, which you uh, mentioned, or was, former. Was, yeah. fosted, was ousted by, yeah. by uh, President Trump. Uh, one one uh, uh, senior official, a, ver a veteran one, which uh, obviously uh, General Kupavasser knows, uh, Fred Hoff, who used to take part in the Israeli, Syrian, Israeli, Lebanese talks. He tried to mediate. He failed mostly because there was not enough backing. There was not enough political will behind him uh, to reach uh, a compromise. But it is doable, especially because the Americans are supporting the Lebanese armed forces and are insisting that there is a distinction between the LAF, the Lebanese armed forces, and Hezbollah. So they have a leverage there. In Lebanon, of course, there are politics involved, the presidential election, uh, parliamentary election in, in uh, Lebanon, but it is um, uh, a crisis in search of a solution. And to the, the point of political issues in Lebanon, we're talking about uh, Hezbollah with a significant political power uh, within the Lebanese government and, and parliament itself. Uh, of course, uh, Amal, which is... Uh, uh, historically, or at least uh, in the last few decades, uh, chairing the, the parliament itself, has already announced that it will support Hezbollah in, in all its decisions with regard to this gas uh, uh, issue. And Hezbollah, as part of its own rhetoric, has published an image with uh, a, a, a image of a uh, the Leviathan, if I'm not mistaken, uh, gas uh, exploration uh, uh, site in the crosshairs of a Hezbollah uh, weapon site. Uh, General Kuprivasar, to what extent is this rhetoric uh, empty of threats, or is it actually uh, with substance that Israel should really take note of? Well, first of all, we should take note of that, of course, and uh, the effort to build the capabilities of Hezbollah so that they will be able to uh, hit Israeli targets, Israeli strategic targets, including the oil, uh, actually the gas uh, fields uh, offshore, are serious efforts, and Israel uh, is putting a lot of uh, emphasis in its activities in uh, the effort to prevent uh, Hezbollah from getting those weapons. And when I spoke before on uh, the issue of building this uh, facility that would produce weapons inside the Lebanon, this is part of the of the, of the issue and the, the ongoing effort uh, and the attacks uh, that Israel carry out in Syria in order to prevent weapons coming from Iran to reach uh, Hezbollah is part of that. <clears throat> and much of the capabilities are already in Syria uh, because we see that uh, there is an ongoing effort by the Iranians and Hezbollah and the Syrians to take weapons coming from Russia, like the Yahont and, uh, and other uh, uh, surface-to-sea missiles, uh, so that they will be on, uh, on the forefront of the capabilities of Hezbollah. And the other thing that one has to say about it is that this is not only in the context of Israeli-Lebanese uh, uh, tensions. There's a framework that's uh, happening simultaneously. That, uh, to a large extent, it's more important than the, the direct confrontation because we are approaching uh, the May 12th uh, deadline that President Trump gave, the, gave Congress and the Europeans you know, to change the Iran deal. Mm -hmm. And recent declarations coming from Washington uh, make it very clear that uh, the, uh, 
the American administration does not uh, going to be satisfied with minor modifications. They, they want more significant uh, modifications, which means that the tensions may rise uh, once we get to May 12th. Uh, and uh, the Iranians want to be ready for that. It's, uh, I'm not saying that they are going to do something, but they want to be able to threaten, they want to be able to deter uh, Israel and, uh, and especially the United States from taking any steps against them. Uh, so uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, propaganda, uh, and, and as it looks like uh, right now, may turn into real threats uh, in the future. We have to be very cautious and be prepared to, to any such uh, development. One sentence. Lines of communications are very sensitive to uh, disruption. It, uh, it is uh, uh, true on land, the road from uh, the coastal plain to Jerusalem, uh, in the air when Ben Gurion Airport was hit, and especially in the sea, because the insurance premium is going to be sky high or deep down in the water, so that it will be prohibitive for uh, maritime companies to, uh, to uh, go on either in gas exploration or in transportation to Israel and other countries, which means that uh, it cannot be a long conflict. Professor Hanen? Well, uh, as we certainly know, it's very easy to lose control on the situation if it's too complicated. It's especially true nowadays, today's uh, in Israel concerning our internal politics. But uh, still, uh, we are coming back to the situation uh, in relations between uh, Lebanon and Israel and the role of regional powers like Turkey and especially Iran and superpowers like United States and Russia. Now we see that we, we enjoyed with the quotation marks and without quotation marks, quite a good period of time when uh, there was a direct connection between Moscow and uh, Jerusalem. And uh, President Putin, who is going to be re-elected in a couple of weeks, uh, oh, actually next week, uh, so uh, uh, um, uh, was ready to take into account Israeli concerns and requests. And uh, in fact, to provide uh, IDF and Israel government with the ab ability to do almost whatever they want in Syria. My, uh, General Kuperwasser might disagree with me, but uh, in principle, that was the understanding in the public opinion. Uh, at the moment... Uh, almost, yes. Almost, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 but now what I can see or hear uh, in the Russian media and read, including reading between lines and hear from the people, now we are a little bit approaching to the situation of 2006, where the Russian public opinion, and especially government opinion, and we saw through the media, was anti-Israeli. Uh, meaning that uh, uh, what uh, succeeded to do Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, in the course of the recent negotiations with uh, President Vladimir Putin, uh, Putin told him, okay, uh, the, the Syria is a special case, and we understand your concern concerning the question of uh, how they call it, uh, the area, uh, dislocation uh, or this escalation area. Uh, and uh, we more or less might agree that you will pr uh, protect your interests. This is not the case of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia is not going to do it, uh, to permit to Israel uh, to do whatever we want. I mean, uh, Israel idea wants. Uh, they might not be interested to prevent it and might not be able to prevent it. But uh, to say that uh, Israeli IDF and Israeli government has the full coverage uh, and full agreement from the both superpowers present here in the Middle East is impossible. Considering the fact, however, that we have a Russian exploration uh, company, a, a significant gas company that oh, is currently the, undertaking uh, yeah. in this uh, gas exploration. Well, that, that's exactly what, what colleagues said. I mean, uh, in, in, in case the Israel would be ready to allocate uh, some concessions concerning the gas and uh, so on and so forth, and maybe to add to that some infrastructure here in Israel and maybe some other um, uh, t t t tasty things. Uh, to Russian companies, uh, the situation might change, but it's unlikely it's going to be now. Mr. Owen? There is a third partner, silent partner to this conflict, which is Cyprus. Because if one looks at the geography, um, it is all part uh, of the so-called uh, economic waters, uh, uh, whatever uh, countries can use up to 200 miles from uh, their coastline, um, uh, if it does not conflict uh, with, with the other country. So Israel is trying to reach some agreements with Cyprus and then with Greece to compensate for the deterioration of its relations with Turkey. And uh, it makes the Eastern Mediterranean um, a, a hotbed 
of conflict. And you may add to that the visit of the Sixth Fleet to Haifa only uh, a week or so ago with the uh, uh, admiral in charge of the Sixth Fleet, uh, uh, a lady uh, named Lisa Franchetti, who uh, conferred with her Israeli counterparts. Uh, this can only be looked at uh, both in Beirut as well as in Damascus and Moscow as preparations for the eventuality of conflict. I'd like to touch base on the next uh, dispute between the two countries uh, that has also uh, uh, brought about significant tension between Beirut and Jerusalem, that is the construction of the border wall on the demarcation line, which is the blue line, as uh, uh, it's called by the UNIFIL, the United Nations uh, Peacekeeping Force, uh, in charge or mandated with uh, uh, securing resolution 1701. Uh, General Kupelwasser, at the moment we're looking at this dispute, uh, to what extent, uh, of course, the, the Lebanese side claims that it's uh, being built uh, in several uh, sections on its own territory, while Israel uh, alleges that it remains only on uh, the blue line and on the Israeli side of the security fence. Uh, what's happening there? First of all, it's not only Israel. The UN has already said that Israel is right in, in its claim and that uh, this entire construction is happening on the Israeli side. And because of that, all the claims of Hezbollah is again in the context of trying to look for excuses to justify what they're doing in the South. So uh, I think it's going to be difficult for them to gain uh, international support and uh, justification for their claims vis-à-vis uh, -vis Israel in this respect. Nevertheless, it wasn't only Hezbollah. It was also the arch enemy of Hezbollah, Prime Minister Khavi. Yeah, all the Lebanese, because this is... A, the reason Hezbollah used it is because it's a method that is, uh, enjoys consensus in Lebanon. That's why they can say, actually, we are working on behalf of Lebanon. We, we, you need us to defend you against the expansionist Israelis. That's, but, but the UN has already said that this is not the case. So it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, problematic. But I would say that uh, we might, uh, coming back to what uh, Amir Owen said uh, a minute ago, we are in the midst of a uh, certain change in the, in the way things stand in 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 what we call today the Northern Front, because it's not Lebanon separately and Syria separately anymore. It's, it's one uh, conglomerate that we have to look at. And the, there are several things that are changing, and we have to, to look at them very carefully. And this uh, issue of the border is just a minor one. First of all, it's, we saw the attempt of the Iranians to carry out a penetration into Israeli territory with the UAV in, uh, on February 10th, which signifies the, the new thinking of the Iranians that they can actually use Syria as a, uh, as a base for, carry, for carrying out attacks against Israel. This is uh, something new, direct Iranian operation. It's not through proxies like they, do, mm -hmm. like they used to do in the past. This is something really new and really interesting and important. The fact that Israel managed to prevent it is something that the Iranians have to swallow and to digest, and uh, we'll see what's, uh, what's going to happen. So the tension is still there. Secondly, I wouldn't underestimate the importance of the change of uh, leadership in the State Department. Mm -hmm. uh, because Tillerson had this uh, idea that the main issue that uh, the United States has to look for in Syria is ISIS. And to make sure that ISIS does not reappear in, uh, in Syria once it uh, was already beaten dramatically. Fighting against or uh, containing the Iranian uh, influence in Iran was only number three on his list and, uh, yeah. and not really very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and when Netanyahu uh, came to uh, Washington last week, this was the main uh, issue he has put on the table. Something has to change in the American attitude towards uh, the Iranian presence in Syria. And... Uh, I believe that uh, there is a possibility, I'm not sure, but it's still to see, but uh, I believe there is a possibility here that uh, one of the repercussions of uh, the change in uh, leadership in, uh, in the State Department is going to be a different approach on the Iranian presence in Syria. So we shall see more pressure on that, uh, and we've already heard what the Americans had to say about the uh, use of chemical weapons and uh, the use of, uh, of Russian uh, airplanes you know, to, to carry out attacks in the Rota area. Uh, this is all indications, these are all indications coming from the White House mainly, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, less patience 
uh, from Washington to what the Russians and Assad is doing and what the Iranians are doing. So it's, it's, uh, we are in a, in a, And the last word I want to say about it, just last word. I'll give you the opportunity to uh, say that in your concluding uh, statement, uh, Professor Khanin, on this uh, specific topic of the dispute of the border and the latest developments on that front. Well, in principle, I agree with what Kalik said, that Israel doesn't have any uh, uh, claim in concern of the territory in Lebanon and uh, will uh, put all this issue uh, everywhere in all the international platforms as their um, attempt uh, to establish defensible border. Uh, what uh, the enemies of Israel or rebels of Israel would, would explain or take it is just to explain it as a, a, a point of Israeli aggression. So probably this issue will be resolved in, uh, uh, in the diplomatic fields before it will come mm -hmm. back to the military one. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you the opportunity to have a closing statement. Mr. Owen, we'll start with you. Lebanon was the only one of the uh, four Arab countries uh, bordering Israel which did not pay, take part in the Six-Day War, and therefore there are no occupied territories in Lebanon. And after Israel uh, has invaded Lebanon in 1982, it left. So the Lebanese or some Lebanese must come up with some pretext, as was said here. First, it was the Sheba farms, which are really Syrian, and uh, or at least in dispute between Syria and Lebanon, Israel is not a party to it. Then Israel withdrew and was uh, very careful to uh, draw the line uh, only on each territory. It even had to destroy several outposts because they were several centimeters into its territories. So now they come up with these two new disputes, which which are, are really fabricated, and Israel is not going to stand for it. General Cooper, well, sir? Three points. One, about, regarding the uh, construction of the, of the wall, we have to remember that what Hezbollah is keep saying repeatedly, that in the next uh, conflict, they intend to penetrate into Israeli territory and to take over settlements along the border. So there's a clear justification for what Israel is doing to protect itself. Secondly, the... Uh, Everything that Israel is doing over there you know, to contain the Iranian and Hezbollah aspirations in Lebanon and Syria is extremely important in creating these uh, strong relations that are building up between Israel and the Gulf states, especially Saudi Arabia, which uh, realize that uh, the only uh, country they can count on in confronting Iran is Israel. That's why we see all kinds of developments. And uh, thirdly, it's very important to make sure that Hezbollah doesn't get the support of the international community indirectly. Many Israelis believed and still believe that the confrontation between Israel and Lebanon is the mistake of history. Uh, we may just hope that there are also Lebanese that believe so. Well, this is all that we can do is hope uh, and pray, of course. Uh, I'd like to thank General Kupelwasser, Mr. Oren, and Professor Hanin for coming here today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.